Podrick, you, you, um, when we announced at Greenbelt that we were going to be doing this Made in Palestine Christmas content, you pinged me a message and you said, hey, can I pitch something to you? Yeah. Uh, it's about the way that we misread the Christmas story. There yeah. was never a stable mentioned in the Gospels. Yeah. And um, so I thought, this sounds really interesting. We need to have a conversation. So what, what's that all about? Because it, clearly it's something that, that bothers you and, and, and that you are on a bit of a mission to, to set right. Yeah, it bothers me enormously because um, kind of every time I hear the Christmas story referred to, you know, whether that's casually on the radio or even when people filled with devotion are talking about it and they say he was born in a gutter or he was born in a cow shed. I want to say, read the Gospels read the Gospels. So typically when people are talking about the birth of Jesus, they're talking about the Gospel of Luke. And like it's Luke chapter two, um, verse six and seven. And while they were there, they're talking about um, having gone to Nazareth to Bethlehem because that was um, Joseph's um, town or home area. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So first of all, there's no mention of stable there. Um, the idea that they were staying in a place that owned a stable is actually imagining that they were staying in a fairly well-to-do place. Um, uh, Mary and Joseph were um, internally displaced because of an occupying force, the Romans, who had a deep love of counting things and they were moving people all around to count, 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 go back here and go back there with no um, attention really paid whatsoever to the question of um, what's that going to do to everyday family life? How far will you have to go? How will you bring in income? Um, and the word there was no, pr no place for them in the inn is really worthwhile looking at. And it's a Greek word. Is it okay if I go into a little bit of Greek? I'll try not oh, to make please. it too geek. Yeah, we, we need a bit of Greek this Christmas. <laughs> we do need a bit sure. of Greek. Yeah. It, it, we can use some helpful way of talking about it, though. The word is kataluma. Nice word to say, kataluma. And in essence, most people lived in a single room structure where they would have eaten, there would have been some kind of family room and slept all in the same place. And in that single room structure, you'd have walked in and there would have been maybe a step of about a foot, a foot and a half up. Um, and there would have been a small platform and that's where everything would have happened, you know, and that would have been the entirety of people's living area. Some people and sleeping area and eating area and cooking area. Some people would have had a room on top and that room is called the Cataluma. And some people would have rented that room out by way of income. And the best way to understand it is some people had Airbnb and that's what the Cataluma was. It was an upper room that you could use for different purposes. And so when it says that there was no room for them in the Cataluma, it means there was no room for them upstairs. So they, Jesus was born wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in the manger. And the question is, is where was the manger? And the answer is right inside the house. Um, people brought their animal. They might have had one animal, maybe two. They brought their animal inside the house at night, A, for warmth and B, for, so the animal wouldn't be stolen. And that is not unusual for that period of time or for that place. Um, all across the world, um, you found that. There's kind of stories told in um, Irish um, language storytelling about animals being inside the house up until the 1800s. Poor farming families who might have had an animal and they would have um, treated that animal with great respect because that animal was part of their family livelihood and provision and income. And so Jesus being born wrapped in cloths and laid in a manger in terms of being put there after he'd been cleaned and etc. That is probably how Jesus would probably have been born in Nazareth, except that Mary would have been surrounded by her kinsfolk. By, by the women of her family. So it wasn't that he was born in that, that any Jewish family said out to the coal, out to the cow shed or out to our magnificently prepared um, uh, stable because they didn't have that. People didn't have a lot of money. And so the story above Jesus' birth is really a story that doesn't expose an innkeeper who was being an awful stingy bastard. What it does is it exposes an empire that says, you people, Go wherever, go somewhere different and we'll count you for the benefit of us measuring ourselves and keeping up the appearances about how 
great our prowess is. And I, I'm always worried that there is a, a convenient um, trope and stereotyping of Judaism in the imagination that any family of Joseph's kin would have, or of whether, whether of kin or not, would have said to a, a woman who's about to give birth, here, get out to the cow shed. <laughs> you know, this is saying, come into our home, give birth here the way the other women in our home, in our household, in our kinship have given birth. My guess, this is pure speculation, is that the men were carted out, told to get out somewhere and that Mary was surrounded by women the way she would have been. And the reality of Jesus' birth is probably the same of lots of other births during that time of census, that um, in as much as people in 30 years time will say, oh, yeah, God, I was born during the pandemic. You know, I obviously can't remember it. And lots of other people will go, oh, gosh, that pandemic and think about all that. Jesus would have been able to say, I was born during the census. Like, all oh, right, what was the story of that? Because he would have been one of many, presumably, born during that census where families were displaced and having to seek for and get hospitality from among their kinsfolk and from among other strangers co-religionists, but perhaps not family, who would have shown the kind of hospitality to each other. And what what does that do, Podrick? So apart from um, reawakening us to that, the, the dimension of empire that was the context, um, what, what does that rereading or that right reading or that mining back into the actual um, way that hospitality worked in that culture, what does that do for us in the Christmas story rather than just the casual, oh, there was no room at the inn, you know, our casual, um, our cultural reading of it. What, what can that do for us, do you think? Well, A, I think, again, it does challenge a, a convenient Christian movement towards anti-Semitism in terms of telling a story of a Jewish birth. Um, and I think that's always very important. B, it does move us toward accuracy because the word cataluma is used a few times in the Gospel of Luke. Um, in the early part, in, in the, with the birth story, you know, the word is translated as there was no place for them in the inn. But later on um, in Luke 22, do you know, toward the time of the Last Supper, like Luke, Luke 22, when Jesus is giving instructions to his followers to prepare the upper room, he says to one of the followers, go to the house and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the cataluma that I may eat Passover with my disciples? And so I think theologically, it's really important to know that cataluma is a really important word at the beginning in terms of there being no space in the cataluma. And at the end, in terms of the teacher asks, where is the cataluma? And that's, I think, a really important thing that the, the Last Supper takes place in the very place where there wasn't space at the beginning. Mm. And I think thirdly, what it does is it shows us that Jesus wasn't unique in being marginalized among his own people, that this is the way that empire works. Empire works in displacing masses of groups of people by treating them all as a consistent whole. You people go wherever you were born and let us count you. And I think that displaces us away from the idea that Jesus was any different from other occupied peoples amongst his own people, that actually this is what empire does. Empire depersonalizes it. And I think the focus on Jesus as, oh, he was born in a cow shed means to imply, well, wasn't everybody else born in a hospital or born in a lovely inn or etc. That wasn't the case. These were large swathes of people who were being carted around the place by an empire that didn't give a damn about them, but did give a damn about the numbers it was counting. And I, especially in the Gospel of Luke, which is phenomenally political, what Luke is doing, I think, is exposing empire that thinks it can move people around places. Whereas I think the message of the gospel is one to say that people who have been occupied, people who have a dignified, have a dignified story and deserve to be treated as individuals, unlike the way that all kinds of populations of people weren't, be being, weren't being treated as individuals by the Roman Empire. And you... Really interestingly, you drew a parallel or made a comparison, you know, um, I was born in the census, I was born in the pandemic, so will people say in 20 and 30 years time. Yeah. As we hurtle towards Christmas this year, Podrick, what, what is the whole backdrop and the context of the pandemic? What that lens, what, what's that doing to you for the Christmas story this year? Well, I suppose one thing that I notice in 2020 as I think about this you know, some people have said, you know, what's your pandemic story been? And my pandemic story is to say, yeah, a little bit of disruption, a bit of worry about money. But like 
what really the pandemic has done has been an apocalypse into inequality. You know, the assumption that people would be able to go, well, just hop on to Zoom for your child's school. That's assuming people have an internet connection. That's assuming they have a device that can be used. Or if there is a device, that somebody isn't ne needing to use that for um, for an income, you know. Um, there's all kinds of ways within which, you know, frontline workers, you know, who are the people who are putting themselves most at risk, whose immigration status has been up for debate on a regular basis, you know. Um, so for me, as I hurtle towards Christmas, I'm thinking of how disrupting the year was for me and for so many people, but how there are really clear levels of what I think needs attention in terms of disruption. And I don't think whatever disruption I've faced needs attention. Um, because that's just, you know, if it wasn't that, it might have been something else. That's, you know, nothing really that's of any serious consequence, I don't think, for me. What I do think is of consequence is thinking about who has been failed by a system that was already failing them, and actually that failure has just become more intense as we move toward Christmas. Who has been displaced? 